let me start by welcoming everybody. My name is uh, Wayne Dooling, and I'm a member of the School of History, Religions and Philosophies here at SOAS, and I will be the chair of our afternoon panel, which is um, as its common theme on human rights and social justice. And I think every one of our speakers will touch on the uh, issue facing every person on the planet today, which of course is the current COVID-19 pandemic. So our first speaker today is my colleague, Mashoud Badarin. Mashoud is professor of law uh, here at SOAS. He has published very widely on issues of Islamic law, and he is one of the founding editors of the Muslim World Journal of Human Rights, and has worked on the Human Rights, on the United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, and the title of Mashoud's talk is the COVID-19 pandemic and the right to the best attainable state of health in Africa. Thank you very much, Mashoud. Um, if you could speak for 10 minutes or so, we can. Thank you very much, uh, Wayne, for that uh, uh, introduction. And I also welcome my co-panelists uh, for this session. I have 10 minutes to speak, so I will just try to be as brief as possible. I'll be speaking against the background of the abstract, which is in the book here. So I would not want to go over that again. But I want to say that, I mean, these are just reflections uh, on uh, against the background that we have a course in the School of Law, Law and Development in Africa, which we have been running for, I mean, about 11 years now. Uh, my colleague Farida Banda teaches on it, and we have another colleague who teaches on this model. Now in that model, we look at how law can contribute to development in Africa. And we look at development from the perspective of human development, economic development, and I mean, social political development. Now I'm being conscious of I mean, the importance of human capital. Um, I have a perspective that human development is the real catalyst for both economic and social political development. And I also, and when we look at human development, we look at issues of human rights. And I have a position that actually the right to health, the right to attainable state of health is actually the most important aspect of human development. Because we find out that, I mean, there is an uh, African Nigerian proverb actually, I hope you will not be bored uh, by my many Nigerian proverbs and philosophies that I will be, I mean, putting forward. There's a proverb in Nigeria that says that, you know, a sick person is only concerned about one thing, to get well. You know, so uh, similarly, you find out that, I mean, the English proverb, health is wealth. And we have seen this in relation to the havoc that, I mean, COVID-19 has created in the economies, in social political situation of many different countries, I mean, today. Now, I mean, I look at it from the perspective of an article I wrote in 2010 in relation to law and development in Africa. And I critiqued the dependency uh, strategy of most African countries to the global north in respect of almost everything. I mean, even in relation to health and everything. Then I advocate strongly, I mean, a theory of uh, self-reliance for African countries. Against that, I describe self-reliance as individual self-reliance, collective self-reliance, and also look at it in relation to international cooperation. Now in human rights circles, a lot of the time, when we look at Africa and some of the things that, I mean, we look upon to improve, we always talk about, I mean, uh, international cooperation. We talk about it a lot. And that is where we look at. And when we are talking about uh, inequalities uh, in the global system, we talk a lot about uh, relation international uh, cooperation. I believe my colleague Farinda will be talking much about that. But the other aspect of it, which I want to emphasize in relation to uh, self-reliance, I want to uh, suggest that in looking at the contested spaces, you know, we also need to talk much more about individual self-reliance and collective. That is individual African countries do what they need to do. And also at the regional level, collectively doing what they need to do. Again, I base this on a Nigerian proverb that says that, you know, if you have a heavy load, it is the owner of the heavy load who tries to lift it first before others will come to help him to lift it. So, I mean, in looking at the contested um, I mean, uh, spaces and issue of identity, I think it's quite essential that, I mean, we look at that um, point of view as well. <clears throat> now, in relation to health issues, we have been here before. 
I mean, when there are epidemics, we find these debates all the time about, I mean, uh, where will the assistance come from? I mean, during the HIV epidemic, during Ebola, you know, there was this, there were these issues about, for example, the global not, not doing much about, I mean, um, providing uh, the international cooperation that is needed. And many African countries have to struggle a lot. So my perspective, I've been reflecting over this. And when um, um, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic occurred, we all know there were a lot of social media discussion. And what really triggered me was, I mean, I was, I mean, uh, part of many discussions when the issue of the vaccine was being discussed, people were talking about Africa being at the end of the line in relation to getting the vaccine and things like that. People were saying so many things. One person, I mean, uh, said something, I mean, apparently not an African. It was on Facebook, not very, I mean, politically correct. He said Africans don't have a choice anyway. I mean, because you find out that, I mean, the um, conspiracy theorists were also talking about the fact that the vaccine will harm Africans and all these things were going on. And people were saying that, no, I mean, like, we don't want the vaccine in Africa and things like that. And somebody just said, well, Af Africans don't have an option anyway. Um, do, do you have an option? Can you produce your own vaccine? It was very poignant to me when that statement was made. And somebody said, well, I mean, apparently a Nigerian, he said, look, Africans, we are in, even if you cannot produce vaccine, we are independent. And he said a Nigerian proverb again. He said, if somebody eating sees me while he was eating and he frowns, I will shame him by not eating when he invites me. You know, and another said, no, rather than not saying that we will not eat, I'll cook my own food, you know, in order to shame him. So if you look at it from those points of view, it triggered my mind that, well, where are we in relation to uh, um, uh, solving this pandemic from an African perspective? I mean, on the concept of self-reliance, uh, which I, I talked about earlier. Now, so when the Madagascar um, president announced that, I mean, they have found an African herbal a remedy for COVID-19, it was controversial. But then, as I said in my abstract, it also put Africa on the, I mean, African traditional medicine on, on, on the scene for, for, for discussion. Now, in relation to the contested spaces, we all know, I mean, the theme of this uh, um, uh, uh, um, symposium, that there's no doubt that the use of traditional medicine is common heritage, I mean, in all African countries. Uh, and a lot of the time you find out that, I mean, we find it contesting the space in many parts of Africa with conventional Western medicine. Now, I mean, one scholar indicates that actually where African traditional medicine is now is one of the results of colonialism. He indicates, and I quote him, he said, a century of colonialism, cultural imperialism held back the development of African traditional healthcare in general and medicines in particular. You know, he said during several centuries of conquest and invasion, European systems of medicine were introduced by colonizers. So pre-existing African systems were stigmatized and marginalized. End of quote. Now this still has an impact today because if you look in the literature, I did a little bit of research. I mean about this. I, I'm not into um, um, sciences or medical, but I mean from a legal point of view, I when I look at it, you find out that I mean this still remains because in many, most of the literature, you find out that, I mean, African traditional medicine is usually referred to as alternative or complementary medicine. Now, if you look at it from that point of view, language also is important. When you talk about complementary medicine, alternative medicine, then it puts it at the back burner, whereby, I mean, uh, to develop it becomes really very, very, very strong. Now, the World Health Organization have actually indicated that, I mean, up to 80%, of the population in Africa rely on traditional medicine. And because of, I mean, the fact that it is accessible, it is, I mean, uh, accessible, it is acceptable to especially people in the rural areas. So my question as I raise in the abstract is that, well, if you we want to be self-reliant, if African countries want to use the self-reliance and make these arguments of contesting, you know, uh, space and also projecting the identity, are uh, African countries really ready this discussion was had during Ebola, during HIV. Is Afri are African countries really ready uh, uh, to say that, well, they are ready for international cooperation to uh, assist uh, this to, uh, uh, to happen? Now, looking at, I mean, uh, uh, the, the materials, one will be able to see that, and one could talk about positive initiatives, particularly from the international cooperation point of view. 
Now, the World Health Organization has been doing so much with, I mean, with the um, African Union. And I was really quite a little bit surprised to find out that actually the African Union itself had um, an, an action on, the, uh, on a decade of traditional medicine, development of traditional medicine from 2001 to 2010. But my research on this indicated that it was just perhaps maybe on paper because I mean, there wasn't anything, there, wasn't, there was no real outcome out of it. Although today, as I said in my abstract, there are more than 30 research institutes on traditional African uh, medicine in many, parts of Afri in many parts of Africa. And the AU and the World Health Organization are really collaborating in various ways in that regard. Now, just recently, actually, I mean, based on COVID-19, the World Health Organization and the I mean, African Union established a regional expert committee on traditional medicine for COVID-19, uh, COVID-19, uh, COVID in order to pass maybe, uh, and they have adopted a chart actually, and also protocols in relation to, I mean, clinical trials to move, I mean, traditional medicine into clinical trials. And in relation to, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? I mean, uh, collective self-reliance. We see many African countries coming together to assist in that regard. I mean, so, I mean um, solidarizing with Madagascar uh, on this, but there are problems. With regard to international community, one will see that perhaps maybe a lot of effort is being done. But in relation to this perspective of self-reliance, I, I found some little bit of problems in that regard. And the main problem is, I mean, the debate about clinical trials. Now, many, of, many have talked about the fact that, well, if African countries want traditional medicine, African medicine to be put at the same par with conventional medicine, then it have to be subjected to the same standards of clinical trials as, I mean, as, uh, as uh, conventional modern medicine. Now, the research have indicated that well, although, I mean, there is a lot of interest in research on traditional herbal medicines in Africa, there's very little of its clinical trials. You know, and that is where I feel that perhaps, I mean, when we talk about contested spaces, I mean, Africans are really pushing for African traditional medicine. There's a lot of work to be done in relation to clinical trials. One author indicated that there are over 1,200, I mean, plant species which are reportedly used for treatment of malaria. Only 13 of them have undergone clinical trials. And out of the many, I mean, laboratory tests that have been done clinical trials, only one single one have been approved. And they talk about so many difficulties in relation to clinical trials. People don't want to come forward. Now, for example, a lot of the time, I mean, the traditional um, uh, medicine practitioners themselves, I mean, their cooperation and, and also, I mean, government uh, are funding in that regard. So I want to say that, I mean, in, in talking about, I mean, the contested spaces and also uh, self-reliance I mean, of Africans in relation to these specific issues, rather than looking at theoretical issues. You know, we've, I, I've seen so much about theory, but in relation to practice, you know, claiming our role in, in the contested space, I think the areas of health are quite important. And African traditional medicine really provides a way by which this can be done. If, for example, we look inwards to ensure that particularly our own role uh, of trying to lift the load first before the international community will come to help us in order to get this through. So these my, are my thoughts on it. I still have some little bit of views here and there, but I know I have only 10 minutes. So I will stop now, perhaps maybe during question time, we can be able to uh, have a discussion. Thank you so much, Wayne, and thanks for your listening. Thank you very much, Mashoud. Our, um, our next speaker is my colleague, Yet Soas Farida Banda. Farida, long time colleague. Um, Farida is Professor of Law and has worked very widely on issues of human rights um, and also issues of migration, specifically on women, uh, law, and human rights, um, and more recently on uh, issues of uh, science, I think, Farida. And, um, no, <laughs> but this is the literature, <laughs> science and literature, human rights and literature. Um, but Farida's title today is um, Who Benefits from the Right to Science? So thank you very much, Farida. Thank you very much, Wayne. Um, following my brother, Mashoud, since he's been quoting House of uh, Proverbs, I have my own book of Proverbs. Oh, okay. I it. <laughs> House of Proverbs, God gives blessings to all men. If man had to distribute them, many would go without. And actually, it's a very nice lead into our 
talk because it's about who benefits from the scientific progress. And so uh, God has given us all life, but not all of us are benefiting from scientific progress. And that's because humankind, uh, rather than man, humankind is in charge of distribution. Um, so very quickly, I, I think I'm going to talk very quickly about, uh, literally very quickly, about the right to benefit from scientific progress, which is the human right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, a covenant as well, a UN covenant. But actually, I wanted to start off with a story. And the story I wanted to tell you about is uh, this year we're celebrating the centenary of the birth of a woman called Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman who developed aggressive cervical cancer in 1957. And as part of her diagnosis, they took cells from her. And they discovered that these cells were, to quote the journal Nature, that her cells had an extraordinary capacity to survive and reproduce, to reproduce. They were in essence immortal. And in this immortality, they actually started to use her cells for the development of um, cancer technologies, IVF, and her cells have been used by biotech companies. And what was interesting is until a biographer called Rebecca Skloot um, wrote her, a book about her, her family had never benef benefited from the use of her cells. Biotech companies had made millions. And it struck me that actually the story of um, Henrietta Lacks is in itself a good metaphor for where we are now which is about whose bodies are used in the development of scientific research and who gets to benefit from that scientific research. And I think it's important to note that it's not the first time that um, specifically here, I'm going to talk about kind of black bodies have been used during the HIV AIDS pandemic that we all experienced, especially those of us from Southern Africa. Um, we saw that the development antiretrovirals um, didn't reach us as quickly. Um, accessing nevirapine, um, if we hadn't had access to India and generic drugs, I don't know what would have happened to us and to the babies that were being born. So there is something that says that although some of the dr these drugs um, have been trialed on us, we haven't been the beneficiaries. And one would have thought that by now one would have learned something. Um, in terms of ethics, the ethics of care, uh, mutual obligations, duties to each other. But clearly what the vaccine rollout has shown is that is not the case. Um, so I remember this time probably we were unrolling into from epidemic into pandemic around now. And I remember the publisher of my book saying, can you write an, um, an afterword? And I had to write an afterword. And one of the things, the last page I said, I hope that by the time this is out, uh, there will be a vaccine developed and that it will be freely given and that Africa would not be left behind. And what do we find? Well, the rollout has started, but Africa has been left behind. Specifically, 80 plus percent of available um, uh, vaccines have been brought, brought up uh, by the third world, I mean, by the first world. Uh, or the global north. And I who live in London have live in a country that has now got three times the, the, the amount of vaccines that it needs. The Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine was tested, including on South African bodies and also on uh, Brazilian bodies. And yet the question is, you would have thought that South Africa, Brazil, anybody else who participated in the AstraZeneca, uh, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccination uh, would have been automatically the first to get of the first roll off, but that hasn't been the case. And this leads one to ask, well, why, how does this come about? And it's not as if human rights hasn't actually addressed this because I started my talk by talking about um, the fact that we have the right to benefit from scientific progress in UDHR, uh, Declaration of Human Rights, and also the Economic, Social, Cultural Rights Covenant. And there is a committee that oversees the Economic, Social, Cultural Rights Covenant, and that's called, um, the, we'll just call it the committee for now. And human rights committees have the ability to write interpretive statements. And these interpretive statements are called general comments. So immediately after um, the rollout, I mean, after the epidemic was moving from, to pandemic, um, the UN Economic, Social, Cultural Rights Committee actually issued a general comment number 25. Um, specifically on um, a right to benefit from scientific progress. And they said in the, and I'll look through some of the things that they said in the general comment um, to show that we have normative standards. And so they said that there should be joint cooperation and research and the poor states should not just be expected to be the ones who um, 
provide the bodies, but not necessarily the benefits. And they said that there was a duty to ensure that scientific pro uh, that the benefits of scientific progress are accessible and affordable to all. They said that discrimination isn't permitted. And it said that we needed to overcome inequalities and pay um, uh, attention to the disadvantaged. The, folk, the committee focuses on this idea of international cooperation. And it says that pandemics are a crucial example of the need for scientific international cooperation to face transnational threats. And the COVID is a transnational threat. So this requires that the WHO should be supported both politically and financially, and not as the Trump government chose to do to have its um, funding cut mid pandemic. It also talks about this issue of extraterritoriality, the importance of states um, ex paying attention to the actions of their private companies, which are registered within their jurisdictions. And so states are required to regulate and monitor the conduct of mul multinational companies over which they can exercise control. Yeah, and so this includes ensuring the companies exercise due diligence, and that includes the prevention of harm and the fact that everybody should be able to participate in the benefits of scientific progress. And so for those of you who are thinking, yes, but they're never going to agree to give up their profits, it's worth noting that the committee does actually acknowledge that there is something called intellectual property. And it says, though, that patents give patent holders a temporary exclusive right to exploit the product or services that they've invented. They can determine the price for these products and services. But, and this is what the committee says, if the prices are set very high, access to these products and services becomes impossible for low income persons or developing countries, um, as has happened with new medicines that are essential for the health and life of, of um, persons with certain diseases. So the committee says we have to strike a balance. And we have to strike a balance between the rights to in of intellectual property for the, 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 the patent holder and also the needs of people. And it specifically says, it reiterates that ultimately intellectual property is a social product and has a social function. And consequently, states parties have a duty to prevent unreasonably high access costs for essential medicines. And so they need to be prevented from under, undermining the rights of large segments of the population to health, food and other things. And so we've reached the end because I know we're pushed for time. And so one of the things that I think one finds is from Henrietta Lacks to the Tuskegee Airmen to the HIV crisis, the one group of people who seem to be disproportionately impacted, who always seem to be at the back of the queue, and that includes with this COVAX, which is supposed to be uh, a WHO-led initiative. I mean, the first African country to get COVAX, I think, was Ghana, and this was just this week tells us something about the right to benefit from scientific progress not being a universal right. It tells us something about macro inequalities. It tells us people from the global south that our lives don't matter, um, even though our bodies are used in the scientific research. And I think that's deeply problematic. And I just wanted to finish there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Farida. Uh, that's incredibly thought provoking. I'll... Next speaker is Christina Hari Masondo, who comes to us from the University of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, Christina wears very many hats. Um, she's a senior lecturer of economic history and development at UKZN. Uh, she's also an ordained pastor, apostle, and bishop of the People of God Christian Missionaries International. She's worked fairly extensively in issues of socio environmental concerns and indigenous knowledge, and um, will be speaking to us today on COVID-19 and the implications of the fourth industrial revolution principles in higher education on the African child in South Africa. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, Wayne, for introducing me. Um, before I start with my presentation today, I think it's very important to explain um, where this uh, talk that I'm going to focus on comes from. Um, it comes from a paper that I wrote with a colleague who is in education, Ms. Mkabela. It was published in December 2020. It was after um, COVID, after the, the, the Minister of Higher Education in South Africa 
uh, came on TV and, and he said to all of us as educationists that uh, since we have COVID and uh, we have to implement online teaching, it's very important that no child must be left behind. So we became troubled and we then uh, wrote a paper on the implications of what the Minister of Education said. Uh, in that paper, I realized that there were gaps that we left behind and the gaps are based on the paper that I'm going to talk about today. The implications of the fourth industrial revolution principles in higher education on the African child in South Africa during the era of COVID-19. I heard my brother and sister, they spoke about Proverbs. I'm also a Proverbs lady today. Oh, so so my, proverb, <laughs> my proverb is Umuntu Akala for pedagogy. It basically says we cannot dispose people. It is linked with human rights issues in African philosophy. It is linked with uh, social justice. When COVID-19 started, you know, we, the whole country was put on a spotlight, you know, because of the fact that we have a lot of uh, vast economic inequalities in Africa. And this indicates that Indeed, there's a failure of post-independence governments to address developmental challenges in underprivileged areas. Hence, uh, the title for the symposium is about contested uh, spaces. And this is about contested spaces because you look at African uh, spaces, African areas, you discover that the governments, the colonialists, they see that they are appropriate for African people, but Africans who live in such areas, they feel that they are not humanized by the spaces they live in because of lack of infrastructure. So then hence there are perpetual colonial pedagogies and with this uh, presentation, I argue that time has come for the globe to embrace what I call migrated pedagogies. Because now we are, I'm excited because, you know, uh, uh, the, the whole globe it is, is forced by COVID 19 to embrace decolonization because now we are going back. To, to, to African culture, where we go back to, 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 the, to the indigenous classroom, which happened in the homestead. So now it's Africanized. Now, because of migrated pedagogies, we have embraced a, 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 a online teaching, and it is also combined with Africanized pedagogy. Uh, globally, there is perpetuation of the idea of Africa as a grotesque. That means Africa being ludicrous, Africa being primitive. As I said that our governments after independence, you can see no impro little improvement of infrastructure. As put by Mudimbe, that Africa is wrapped in the ongoing paradigm of difference that demotes its standing in world affairs and questions its influence on human civilization, progress and development. And for me, the paradigm of difference is a central theme of coloniality, which replicated a Africa that was an, and is considered primitive, underdeveloped, and unscientific and irrational. I believe that African governments have to embrace this philosophy of Umuntu Agalasa and ensure that we start uh, improving uh, uh, African areas. You know, our response to COVID-19 was like a knee jerk, you know, reaction to a crisis. It is so painful because we opted online teaching, which is, which is good, but we never looked at pedagogies that can humanize those uh, African uh, students who are marginalized. But we need to take into account challenges of underprivileged students who live in uh, areas that have infrastructure that is unreliable, electricity also. Some areas are not even electrified and there is in internet connectivity problems. 
There are areas in South Africa without electricity and students find it difficult to connect. Online pedagogies aligned with the current fourth industrial revolution, which Davis argues it refers to the advent of cyber physical system involving entirely new capabilities of people and machines, which is touching virtually every side of our daily life, affecting how people relate to te technology and altering how and where people work. Uh, hence, I said, now is, is migrated pedagogy in teaching and learning. Unfortunately, as I said, uh, African students and some black students, they are experiencing lack of infrastructure and it's difficult for them to engage in online teaching. Now let us talk about higher education and fourth industrial revolution in the context of COVID-19. Uh, you know, when you look at um, our universities and Africa as a whole, we inherited uh, from the apartheid regime and the prior government's challenge of infrastructure is many universities were separated according to race, whereby whites were allotted higher funding than blacks. As a result, many poor students are alienated in the context of COVID-19 because no access to basics that can assist them in teaching and learning in accordance with the online teaching pedagogy. Students argue that the ones that I teach as I will uh, uh, mention in my reflection, they argue that it is difficult to work at home because the homes where they live, many of them are in rural context and some of them in those rural context, they're overcrowded. And while they are busy with their work, they complain that they, they have to even do their chores while they, they are busy with lectures. And literature on higher education and COVID-19 and also the fourth industrial revolution also explains that uh, it is very important that transformation occurs because at the moment transformation is very slow uh, uh, in the 21st century. Students experience what Thebon uh, says is ex existential inequality which is a rejection of equal acknowledgement and respect and is a powerful source of humiliation, dignity, autonomy. Hence, Fraser regards this ex existential inequality as the politics of misrecognition. For me, this misrecognition is about the killing of other knowledges, you know, uh, 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 and also the fact that uh, the, 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 when these uh, the, the, our governments became liberated, they never looked at how to improve the African areas. So this paper then suggests that pedagogies that do not embrace the students' context are adhering to social injustice and violate human rights as they dispose students. Balasa abantu, balasa Abafundi, they dispose students. An effective pedagogy has to align with student settings, knowledge and beliefs. When we teach is very important. An effective lecturer, effective teacher has to look at the context of a student so that they can align their teaching. As explicitly, explicitly argued by Ndobu Gajeni that while African people continue to make history after the colonial encounters and even under direct colonialism, they were no longer able to do so outside coloniality. Hence, I argued at the beginning that even our governments, they see that uh, African people don't deserve the best. Hence, the areas are not developed. Now I want us to focus on the principles of the fourth industrial revolution. I'll only tease out two for the purpose of this, of this presentation. Uh, the principle of uh, the fourth industrial revolution emphasizes that for us to engage in fourth industrial revolution, it's very important that we have data. There is infrastructure like electricity, connectivity must be there and also reliable. Unfortunately, Mtsanga and Muloi have indicated that in African countries, 
principle of infrastructure to support fourth industrial revolution is a serious challenge because of high cost of data, connectivity, and unreliable electricity. This conclusion is also constant with several studies like Atnan and Var Daniel. They certainly claim that lack of access to fast, affordable, and reliable internet connections hindered the, the process of online learning among Africans and in African areas. Another important principle that Squab and David mentioned is the fact that issue of fourth industrial revolution is about what it means to be human. Hence, and Segeris argues that fourth industrial revolution will result in advancing humanism and democracy and improving accountable innovation and consequently adaptiveness as well as decoding technological development that will be inclusive and render creative opportunities for all citizens. My problem is that unfortunately in Africa, the fourth thing that the principle of a uh, humanization that comes with a uh, fourth industrial revolution as Squaff and Davis have argued is not so. As Mthanga and Lohe ha have argued that the fourth industrial revolution model dehumanization as many Africans live in under, under resource spaces which affects participation in online teaching. Now let us talk about the proverb that my brother and sister uh, spoke about earlier, but mine is Umuntu Agalashwa. And I saw a solution uh, for this on the online teaching uh, that maybe it has to embrace this uh, 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 proverb, this and also align the pedagogy of Umuntu Agalashwa. Because as is, a lot of students, they feel that they are disposed, balashiw. This Umuntu Agalashwa pedagogy is a decolonial take on future pedagogies by incorporating lessons from African history and experience. It is a pedagogy that promulgates the notion of knowledge restructuring and embraces identities of all students. As suggested by Ndovu Gajeni, decolonization must robustly engage with Euro North American centric epistemology that continues to sideline knowledge from other parts of the world that is more relevant to the realities of the struggling peoples of Africa. So the proverb of Umuntu Agalashwa and the pedagogy of Umuntu Agalashwa infest that there is intrinsic work in each person, whether they come from poverty stricken areas, whatever, but the, everyone is important and cannot be disposed. The sad proverb condones social justice and human rights for all, implying that in terms of fourth industrial revolution, equality must be realized and implemented. So this pedagogy is inclusive. Again, what is important about Umuntu Agalashwa, it, it is part of uh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu draws from these values, love. So with this Umuntu Agalashwa pedagogy, it implies that students have to be loved. When you love someone, you ensure that there is success. You support them. Care. It implies that we cannot dispose them. The fact that they belong, you know, they cannot have connectivity. Like my university, I will say it is implementing Umuntu Agalashwa because they assist students with, with network. Those who don't have connectivity, they call them to you to, 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 to be accommodated in our university. Participation. Because with the values of Ubuntu, participation is key. If students are enrolled in higher education, there's no connectivity at home. We have to be creative and ensure that they engage in um, online teaching. Another important fact about Ubuntu Agalashwa, Ubuntu, is respect. You know, respecting people by improving their areas 
as I spoke about contested spaces. And also Umundu Agalaswa and the concept of Ubuntu is about equality. So Umundu Agalaswa pedagogy in relation with the fourth industrial revolution and higher education contests the suffering of Africans against what Galaga infers as an estrangement and deprivation that was implemented through a combination of colonial policies that were through indirect and direct rule compulsory particularities particularization and ghettoization. Uh, talking about my reflection, I'm going to be short. I think my time is almost up. Uh, my reflection, the students that are, 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 I'm talking about uh, in my reflection, they are my honors students from last year. Our first, second semester ended now in January. So many of these students economically, they are poor and they come from um, rural context. So these students, they are African, all of them, they are around 24. And as this uh, second semester, I decided to, to, because I teach economic history. So this is part of, you know, issues of economics. So we started engaging in how, how are your experiences when it comes to online teaching? And many of them went to, to an extent of saying, we feel as if we are being disposed because our areas where we live in, we don't have connectivity. And with, you know, in terms of that, being Ugulashwa, it means also that even the online, it is difficult because of connectivity. So then also when it comes to the problems of, of, of online teaching, many students also mentioned that Balaki were because one, even those who are in locations, the electricity is unreliable, lack of infrastructure, some don't even own smartphones. Some complain about the laptops that they have that are of low quality. Because some of them, as they are in honors, they got their, their laptops when they were doing undergrad. So those laptops, they complain they are, they are, they are of low, low quality. And December, January, to show that um, online is also disposing some of the African students who live in these areas that are underdeveloped, that lack infra reliable and lack infrastructure. We have catch up. As I said, my university embraces Umdu Agalato. So they make it a point that they assist students. So what we did is that, unfortunately it was December, they had to go home. So we had catch up for them. Many of them could not engage in catch up because they, of the areas they live in. Now my way forward. My Christina, way forward. Sorry, Christina. Could I could I please ask you just to draw to a close in the next minute or so? <laughs> okay. My way my way forward. One is going back to our roots. When I say our African roots, that it is very important that we embrace the African classroom. And as you know, in a globalized manner, we also embrace online. Umuntu Agalaswa is very important that we embrace this uh, a pedagogy that focuses on social justice. As a conclusion, it is very important to adhere to the principles of fourth industrial revolution as our government also to ensure that they improve our area so that our students can be uh, uh, embraced. And also as researchers, it's very important to be robust to be radical and unapologetic when we write because the government is listening and they read. Sometimes they will ask us to come up with resolutions. I believe social justice will okay. Hence, I propose Umuntu Agalaswa a pedagogy as a, a teaching a pedagogy that can be uh, utilized alongside the uh, online teaching. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, your paper I in fact touched on some of the themes that uh, Farida raised, but let me uh, move on. Um, and but before I do so, can I please uh, sort of remind members of the audience that they could just type their questions in the Q and A window that we have. Our next speaker is uh, Lukono Nguni from the University of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, Lukono has um, worked on various fields, and amongst other things, he is a lecturer in the School of Social Sciences 
and is also a researcher of the at the Maurice Webb Relations Unit at the University of Kuzulu Natal. He works on issues of conflict and conflict uh, resolution and issues of transformation. He um, will speak to us today on observing social distance, observing social distancing in the time of COVID-19 and foretelling prospects of social justice. Uh, thank you very much, Lukona. Uh, thank you, Wayne, uh, for the kind uh, welcome. Uh, I will try and be very mindful of the time that I have uh, with you. Um, of course, it's interesting to reflect today, given that on the 18th of February, it was the World Day of Social Justice as per the United Nations and embracing the importance of uh, pursuing, you know, the struggles under this social justice banner. Of course, uh, this is not a new concept uh, that I want to unpack in terms of social distancing in the time of COVID-19 because Sociolo sociologists and social scientists have been grappling with this term, at least some will say as far back as the early 20th century in about 1903 with Jean-Gabriel de Tade, a French philosopher. But of course, <clears throat> as this uh, phenomenon of social distance uh, continues to be unpacked and grappled with uh, by scholars, activists, and uh, political uh, role players alike, there seems to be disagreement really as to what should we focus on. Uh, but I don't think it's necessarily the disagreement that is important, but perhaps the broadness of the uh, space of social distance that we talk about. So we've got elements where we talk about affective social distance, uh, questions of how people within a group uh, tend to feel or perceptively feel about each other. Uh, we've got issues around, you know, interactive social distance. But of course, we do know that we also have, you know, uh, social economic uh, divides that lead to social distance. And that's where we enter concepts of class and, you know, marginalization of people within a society. And often in our context here in South Africa, we have seen the concept of social distance being used by political actors to uh, you know, speak of the gap between those who are governed and the governors. And so this talks about power dynamics that are inherent within society. And of course, it determines the lines of accountability, the lines of uh, responsiveness of governance, because when there is social distance between those who are governed and the governors, it tends, of course, to precipitate into issues of um, uh, unresponsive governance and at times a great uh, a distance between uh, decision makers when they decide what they ought to do in society rather than you know uh, embracing concepts of participate participatory democracy and making sure that there is a consultative framework in place as i was thinking about uh, this presentation and of course this conference in general when we talk about you know, contested spaces and issues of uh, asymmetric uh, power relations. And of course, in those contested spaces, we deal with questions of identity and becoming and being. I was sent back to a conference I attended uh, in the Vatican uh, with the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences uh, in 2017. And the theme of that conference was towards a participatory society, new roads to social and cultural integration. So in the social sciences, this idea of contested spaces, which ought to express itself in forms of social and cultural integration because of problems that we encounter in the spaces of social and economic exclusions, which of course talks to the creation of in-groups and out-groups. And of course, you then, uh, if you come from a developmental perspective as I do, you also have to contend with questions of the core and the periphery. Who is in the core and the core being the determining power base of all life in many forms. Uh, if you look at it from a resources perspective, the core is where the raw materials tend to accrue and then they get beneficiated and then they are sent back to the periphery as finished goods. Of course, you can also look at it in terms of intellectual engagement where the core represents uh, the place where people in the periphery uh, migrate towards. And that's why we talk about concepts of brain drain in certain areas, because there's disproportionate bargaining power in the society where the core 
uh, can attract uh, magnetically towards itself all that is prestigious, be it intellectually or otherwise. So these are the concepts that uh, we try and unpack in social sciences. We have been doing this for a long time. And that's where the issue of social distance or social distancing came in as a point of curiosity for me. Because when the pandemic started, some people sort of said uh, to the World Health Organization, it's not social distancing that you are talking about. Perhaps you should talk about physical distancing. Because once you talk about social distancing, you may be entering issues of you know, breakage in social solidarity, a breakage in terms of, you know, uh, Dr. Harry Masondo talking about Ubuntu, uh, those concepts wherein we come and rally towards each other to be there for one another, to comfort each other. But I want to propose that uh, sociologists, uh, alarmed by this concept of social distancing as part of the non-pharmaceutical interventions proposed to us by the health sciences. In fact, they might have been too early of the building blocks to defend that perhaps let's not use social distancing, rather use physical distancing. For all intents and purposes, what the lockdowns did for us was in actual fact to introduce social distancing and to reimagine socialization in actual fact, as the lockdowns went on, in the sense you had a situation where we had to isolate, stay at home, quarantine, uh, not go to work. And of course, then we had to rethink how do we socialize. But also other intervening factors began to be real, was that if you are in a social space and there is physical distancing, but people consume alcohol, over time, observers were saying people tend to let go of their masks, people let to, tend to let go of their 1.5 meter social distancing, and they want to be closer, they want to dance together, they want to hug each other, because now they have been lubricated by these beverages they have imbibed on. So in fact, it became necessary for us to socially distance in order to fight the pandemic to organize less activities, less events. We started restricting the number of people that can attend a funeral because we did not want too many people in the same area. I mean, if you look in the South African context, we began to talk about no night vigils, something that is so important to some people as a form of solidarity, sympathizing together, showing empathy and ensuring that emotionally we are there for each other and we attempt to repair the damage that has been done by the loss and the bereavement. Also, I want to propose that social distancing in terms of the health sciences perspective as a non-pharmaceutical intervention then did in fact take root as much as we may have firstly pontificated that this is physical distancing we are calling for it became necessary to socially distance because the more we got together, the higher the risk for the spread of the virus. And then what we now have to look towards is what are the effects of the health sciences uh, version of social distancing on the social distance that I say we have been grappling with in the social sciences as far back as the early 20th century. And I, my, I make some propositions which, I mean, I'm still drawing in terms of other people uh, who have written on this. I mean, even the likes of Arundhati Roy have tried to talk around the pandemic and what it probably represents. I mean, at some point she calls it a portal into a new imagined world and whether or not we are being too, uh, uh, too optimistic when we talk about COVID-19 as a portal to a new world. Of course, uh, this concept of social distance then becomes a serious uh, point of curiosity because it talks to a lot of uh, the values that are important in the social justice space. Those values being uh, issues of, uh, I said solidarity earlier, but you want to make sure that there's trust, there's care, 
uh, there is morality in the struggle towards social justice. Unfortunately, these are habitual values that tend to be created if we co-create and if we coexist in a common in a in a space of commons, as some people would call it. Unfortunately, what the pandemic has done, all people that can connect are ourselves who are somewhat in, in terms of marginality, not at the periphery. We are quite at the core. We've got connectivity. It's even worse if you talk about the continent of Africa where I am, where about 60% to 69% of the continent being without electricity, meaning that they cannot enjoy this virtual space that I do. I'm not even talking about questions of data and connectivity, just electricity. And of course, I often say, um, we know what we, we usually say that in darkness, uh, all sorts of things tend to thrive. So when physically, materially, there is that darkness without electricity, we can already imagine that people are socially distanced from the core that is the world. So Wayne, I see there your mic is on. I'm going to wrap up and just say some of the areas that I'm now concerned about is to say this social distancing as a non-pharmaceutical intervention has probably done more damage in terms of achieving social justice in the world today because we too have become now on the margins, even from those communities we used to travel to, the communities we could service with the little disposable income that we had. And of course, we, and, and, and as of course, as some of the colleagues spoke about, you know, vaccine distribution and what uh, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres calls our biggest moral test as the world in terms of that distribution. It's quite clear to me that by virtue of the social distancing from a health sciences perspective, we have become removed and uprooted from the communities which we used to be within. And I think for that reason, we need to start begin a reconciliation of the social distance that we were experiencing pre-COVID and understanding what harm and to what extent we have affected social distancing through the non-pharmaceutical interventions from a health sciences. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you very much, Rukana. Uh, your presentation is incredibly thought-provoking and, of course, speaks to all the, all the presentations that we've had um, thus far. So our next speaker is uh, Janet Mutuki, um, and Janet will um, speak to us on issues of marginalization, COVID-19 and issues of marginalization and social justice. Janet is a senior lecturer in gender studies in the School of Social Sciences at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And she's been actively involved in finding innovative ways of teaching and ways of collaborating and publishing with students. Her research interests lie at the intersection of gender, transnationalism, development, and peace building. And she's published quite extensively in all of these areas. So thank you very much, Janet. We look forward to hearing your talk. Uh, thank you, Wayne. Good afternoon, everyone. I go right into my topic. And um, the full title of my presentation is The Implications of COVID-19 on Marginalization and Social Justice Amongst Asylum Seekers Living in South Africa. In this presentation, I focus on the physiological and psychosocial vulnerabilities of asylum seekers living in South Africa, while underscoring the centrality of social justice in the pandemic context. I will also look at some possible ways of navigating the intersecting spheres of health, economic, and social systems in order to mitigate uh, marginalization. With the fall of apartheid in 1994, South Africa has uh, seen a, an increase in all categories of, of new and of new forms of migration uh, that includes um, asylum seekers from across sub-Saharan Africa. By 2011, the country had become the largest recipient of asylum applications in the world, with more than 207,000 applications out of a total of 839,000 globally, as reported by the United Nations High uh, Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, currently, it is estimated that there are about 266,700 refugees and asylum seekers who have sought international protection in South Africa. 
Out of this number, 78,398 are recognized refugees and asylum seekers. South Africa is an appealing destination for asylum seekers from sub-Saharan Africa due to its strong legal and human rights framework for refugees and asylum seeker rights. And this can be seen through its 1998 Refugee Act, which uh, actually has an asylum policy. Now, despite the progressive laws and policies around rights of asylum seekers, there is a, a, a huge gap in the implementation of these policies. This um, has uh, then resulted in a largely unsuccessful asylum management process. The asylum seeker status then becomes a, a very uncertain and uh, isolating phenomenon which is exacerbated by the lengthy procedures of obtaining asylum documents as well as renewing them. Further, the asylum documents do not necessarily lead to improved living conditions or socioeconomic status. As a result, asylum seekers face numerous challenges, uh, some of which include lack of employment and education opportunities, lack of access to public health care services. Uh, they they also face integration and social cohesion challenges, which are reflected in the violence and tensions that exist between them and the local communities. The coronavirus disease has further exacerbated the marginalization experiences of asylum seekers. The lockdown containment measures put in place to curb the spread of the disease worsened their conditions. Asylum seekers whose only source of income is in the informal sectors have thus seen their livelihood sources diminish. And this is even more so for women asylum seekers who are reliant on this informal income for paying rent, uh, for paying bills, as well as uh, providing food for their families. The South African government has put place, uh, has put some systems in place, and uh, they, they have put some relief mechanisms in place to assist small and informal businesses and the most vulnerable. This uh, have, however, only been extended to local citizens living out asylum seekers and refugees. At a physiological level, the asylum seekers are at a greater risk of contracting the virus due to limited access to nutritional food options and healthcare resources. Many of them live in crowded conditions and the scale of the outbreak could, act, could be massive, particularly for this vulnerable group. The lockdown has also exposed asylum seeking and uh, refugee women to increasing risk of sexual and gender-based violence. For these women, homes are often also sites of abuse and violence. And uh, their homes are not actually strictly homes. Most of them stay in informal settlements. So they, these are sites of uh, abuse and violence. In the current crisis, Stress over the uncertainty of sustainable future livelihoods has also led to increased cases of domestic violence. The support for this category has unfortunately largely been left to the civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations. These organizations has, have uh, put in some efforts to alleviate hunger and provide some relief to the economic situation of the asylum seekers refugees and undocumented migrants. These efforts are, however, not sustainable without government support. The government, on the other hand, also faces daunting challenges in the ability to wholly manage this crisis. They have challenges such as fiscal shortfalls, among others. So we see that uh, there are challenges in, support, in offering support to this category of the population on many fronts. The United Nations has proposed some, some four basic tenets that could drive efforts to support uh, uh, migrants, and that would also include asylum seekers and refugees in this era of COVID-19. The first tenet is that the exclusion is costly in the long run, whereas the inclusion pays off for everyone. The second tenet is that the response to COVID-19 and protecting the human rights of migrants are not mutually exclusive. You don't have to accomplish one at the expense of the other. Both can be accomplished at the same time. The third tenet is that no one is safe until everyone is safe. The fourth one is that migrants are actually part of the solution to the, the crisis of managing the, to the, managing the pandemic. The International Labour Organization also confirms that the inclusion of migrants in national COVID-19 policy responses can help to
to ensure that the realization of equality and social justice. So um, in my paper, I then argue that leaving out this category of asylum seekers out of the national response safety net may lead to negative coping strategies and secondary health concerns. Scalatech um, advances that work on coronavirus cannot actually be limited to the level of virology and improving health systems. And this is in agreement with the previous speaker that um, social sciences actually play a huge role in the management of this crisis. Scalatech further advances that um, work on coronavirus should employ feminist, human rights-based, intersectional and justice-oriented analysis to counter issues of marginalization and social justice in dealing with the pandemic. The particular difficulties that female asylum seekers face reaffirm the need for practical and sensitive application of international and domestic gender guidelines. So in, um, in my paper, I recommend that measures be put in place by relevant authorities to provide a safety net for asylum seekers. As a start, the South African government could consider a regularization of asylum seekers, particularly those who have been in the procedure for over 10 years, as an exceptional measure to assist in the current context. I would also, in agreement with the Mkubang, um, argue that equality and social justice for asylum seekers is, is, a, is a collaborative effort which can be uh, achieved by engaging with and including migrant-led organizations, civil society organizations, international organizations, and as well as researchers working with migrant groups. And this would work together towards developing programs that consider migrants. Um, so um, there, um, that, that's my conclusion. And uh, thank you very much. I think I have not uh, taken the 10 minutes. No, that's, uh, thank you very much, Janet. That's, well, that was very interesting. And thank you for sticking to time. And um, we have one more speaker and thank you very much for bearing with us. We've got a sort of packed program this afternoon. Um, uh, we're running slightly over time, but we, we've got a bit of margin. So our last speaker is Parangili Zondi from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Parangili has worked uh, ex uh, quite widely in uh, various areas and worked in um, worked for the South African government in the Department of Social Development, amongst others. Um, and she currently works on issues of development, HIV AIDS and uh, women's programs. Uh, research interests are in policy development, migration, gender-based violence, and diaspora studies. So thank you very much, uh, Bologeri, if you could um, speak to us um, on your topic, which is unpacking marginalization and social justice in the advent of COVID-19 in South Africa, myth and reality. Um, good afternoon, uh, and thank you for having me in this virtual space. I was hoping that I will be able to, to share my slides because I'll be talking through a PowerPoint presentation. However, I'm not sure whether I'm being uh, disadvantaged by um, me being skilled in technological advancement or it requires that I, I, I'm granted permission by the host. Um, I think we may need to grant you permission, um, but can I ask Angelica, can... Yes. Um, I think you can you, you can share your screen, Valungile. If you do share screen, you should be able to share. I just want to um, make you aware that we literally have about five minutes, seven minutes. Thank you. Can you? Okay. Um, let me try to exit. Okay. Uh, I think if you just do share screen from the bottom of the screen, the green. It says host disabled participant screening sharing. Uh, um, okay, that's strange. She's not a co-host, uh, Angelica, so she yes, won't be a co-host. Yes, okay. uh, Anna, please, can you make a co-host? Right now. I'm sorry about that, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Fine. Please try again now, should work now. Um, is my PowerPoint presentation um, audible to all of us? Uh, we can't see your screen, not yet, no. Oh, Lord. 
I'm not sure what is happening. But in the interest of time, allow me to just uh, make a presentation, but it was gonna be of great importance that I take you through to some of the images, which I think would have amplified the discussion um, and some of the critical issues that I, I wanted to, to, to put across, all of which I have also covered in the, in the abstract that I provided. Um, the topic that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, um, and I, I, I also recall when uh, discussing it with a colleague of mine, she was saying, why Balungile are you having interest in this political economic issue? And my response to, 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 to a colleague of mine was that there is no topic that is not anthropological because any political economic issue uh, touches at the heart of the society, at the heart of human beings, as well as the heart of individuals. And if um, those, those, those issues are not um, discussed, therefore um, we will then um, have um, an amount of of, 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 of societies, of families, whose voices have not been given the space. As a result, we'll have political stakeholders who would often break about having done exceptionally well, just because it is within their level of thinking that they feel that they have actually responded to societal issues or to family issues without having been informed by voices of people that are directly um, affected. So um, the title of my presentation goes as um, Unpacking Marginalization and Social Justice uh, in the Advent of COVID-19 in South Africa, Myths and Reality. The context is, is within um, COVID-19, but the presentation would not. But I would just appreciate COVID-19 for, for having created, a provoked a thought for me to question the extent to which South Africans either as citizens, as well as um, by which of being, of being born in South Africa, as well as being um, active voters and the extent to which they have been his, historically incurred the burden, uh, the burden of being marginalized, or perhaps uh, begin to appreciate if there has been um, a space through which they have begin to, uh, begin to celebrate social justices, or, or, or also learn if um, they are still, um, trapped in the, in the cage of poverty and social injustices. So um, um, in a lot of scholarship, anthropologists have also focused in, 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 in embarking in a lot of uh, ethnographic um, studies with the hope of categorizing what remains a myth um, and what remains a reality. So from an anthropological lens, um, marginalization um, is um, a condition and a process that, pre that present individuals and groups from full participation in social economic, which are enjoyed by a, wide, uh, a wider group or a wider society. And when a person or a group of people is marginalized, it means that uh, they are denied um, significant involvement in mainstream economy, political, cultural, as well as social activity. And we know that from, um, the, the, the times of uh, colonial era in South Africa, um, a larger proportion of the population in South Africa fell um, experienced marginalization. Uh, but from there, the, the apartheid uh, era continued to also subject um, racially um, the proportion um, or a population proportion um, to experience another increased amount of marginalization as they were excluded from um, economic um, activities. Uh, but then um, some of the, 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 the good things that I also pick uh, from the apartheid era is that um, in as much as there was poverty, but the extent or the trend of poverty was not as exacerbated as of now during the, 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 apartheid, the, the, the democratic era. Um, social justice was, was, was meant to have been celebrated as from the onset of of, of the democratic dispensation. And again, um, what did the South African government intended to realize with the thought that it was a policy gap was that each South African, irrespective of the geographical area, gender, race, they should then begin to celebrate uh, or they deserve equal economic, political and social rights. And these uh, social rights imply that you would not be hindered uh, just because you are black or green or orange, 
but you should also equally celebrate what the orange person has historically um, um, celebrated. So, um, so what they needed to do was that they positioned themselves as a responsive government to ensure that equality um, becomes the social identity of all South Africans. But what has happened historically, uh, moving from the colonial apartheid right to the con contemporary days of democracy, we see that um, nothing has changed. And I know that to those who, begin, who, who aspire to uh, a common say uh, by the African-led uh, government, as they often say, they've got a good story to tell. Um, they would then say, think that I'm somehow bitter just because uh, for me, I, I don't think there is a good story to tell. Simply because um, there's still a persisting economic gap uh, between people. One of the, the, the images that I, hope, I, I, I was hoping to present was to show the economic uh, disparities amongst people where we see uh, people um, uh, in the category of, of, of being white continue to, to, be, to be having more economic or having an economic advantage compared to black people who are still at a very low level of the economic emancipation. Um, and again, I was hoping to also um, take you through uh, an image which is also um, uh, depicting um, the gap between the employment, which has all also been um, experienced by people whom the, the, the democratic um, uh, government had hoped to, 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 to release from the cage of poverty. Because what, uh, what Ustole and Dumatonti have said that um, a marginalization is, is, is be becomes um, a reality just because of, um, of a nexus of factors and poverty and employment is a result, a uh, contribute to, to that um, exacerbated uh, gap or experience of marginalization. Um, then Sitole says that um, it is worrying that uh, the South African government continues to say they've got a good story to tell Yes, if you analyze the population pyramid of, of South Africa as a country, there is um, a bulky population that seems to be out of the economic, um, uh, economic institution and they're, and they're heavily dep dependent on the, on the ground. And I, hence, I felt that it is time we create spaces from which we will anthropologically um, understand whether uh, does the provision of social so, so solidarity grant uh, within the brackets of 350 to 400 imply marginalization or it serves as a social justice which uh, ensures the distribution of wealth from those who were historically excluded? Uh, does uh, the provision of social grants include, uh, mean um, um, accelerated economic opportunities to people um, does it really privileges um, serve as a privilege to, 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 to societies or individuals and the extent to which it does me, uh, give uh, meaningful economic support and if it ever does um, get people uh, a lot of, a, a number of our, our, our households um, above the, the poverty line. So uh, 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 this, 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 um, Paper is hoping to, to put across voices of, of people who were, who were then made to real to think that they are born free and also expect that the government will do any everything for, for them and uh, whom they have because of um, um, I would say non-responsive policies, they have now become um, um, uh, statistics of unemployed people. So I'm hoping that um, giving them open uh, 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 spaces, um, they will then uh, be able to, 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 to offer their voice with regards to the extent to which um, social, uh, these social grants mean to them. Um, is it uh, the identity that they would want to, to embrace up until they die? Is it the, the economic uh, support that they would need from the government who said um, during the, uh, the democratic dispensation that um, it, it will create uh, socioeconomic activities where each and every person will be an economic human being. 
So um, we would also, I would also want to gather from them if marginalization and social injustices remain a myth um, as they would possibly maybe uh, buy into the thinking of the government which says they have a good story to tell or they will then uh, be in the, in the space where they will say um, uh, marginalization and social injustices um, is still a reality even uh, during the contemporary time. Um, I would also uh, from create an opportunity um, for them to also from their drawing from their daily experiences of being unemployed people to um, to, to to also um, uh, 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 contribute to what um, uh, forming uh, policy responses that which uh, would make them economically active, not only um, for the just because they would have to glorify democracy, but for them to be able to live the life that is is not um, a, a restricted by not being you know e economically active. So I believe that uh, by creating such spaces of conversion, political structures and leaders will then listen to what people want to receive as an ideal socioeconomic social justice intervention. Maybe if we create these spaces, government would stop to think that um, in any given situation, like we've been in the COVID-19, where government should have said, it is time that we revise our economic, um, um, our economic interventions. Instead, he, he then thought that people need to survive uh, because of, a, of this grant provision. So now it is time that we, re, we give them space to say, to guide what government should do on their behalf, because uh, in case they cannot do anything. Um, this paper is um, also will also enlist uh, variables that indicate how the social grant has marginalized, if it, it has ever, or unmarginalized people. Um, it will def it, it, it will also um, it will also um, conclude whether it is uh, South Africans, especially the ones that have been categorized as born free, if they have pride in in what has been made as their economic provision or they still wanting to, 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 to have a revised socioeconomic interventions from government. In conclusion, I, 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 as a South African, I also pride uh, to see, I, if South Africa is, I conclude by saying, if South Africa is to pride itself as a democratic space for all, marginalization, social injustices, in, injustices should not be the symbolic identity of South Africa. And this cannot be dis, um, disputed that if you see a young person in South Africa, the first thing that comes to mind is that um, you know for a fact that he, she is, he, he or she is surviving on, on, a, on a grind and she or he is unemployed. And lastly, I would like to conclude by saying that public policy should be seen responsive to historical economic issues of South African just because it is clear that from the times of the colonial era right up to the com contemporary time, there has been no change. If change has, has, has occurred, it hasn't been um, maximized to the benefit of, of people who are during uh, um, voting times are, are trusted to cast their votes with the hope that their life will change. Thank you so much. I hope I was within the given time. Thank you very much, Colonel Gilly. We um, we unfortunately very close to the edge of our allotted time. In fact, we over we over our allotted time, and our next panel is due to start at um, quarter past two in five minutes' time. So I don't think that I'll have time to um, address questions, or that I'll have, I don't think I'll have time to ask the panelists to address questions. Although I must uh, draw your attention to the fact that uh, we do have questions, and some of our panelists have answered those questions, if you could just kind of have a look at the Q&A uh, window, you'll see a bit of discussion between some of the people who've asked questions and, uh, and the panelists who answered them. Um, so I think we will have to draw to a close. I'll just say in, in, in uh, conclusion, just in response to Bolongili's uh, presentation about marginalization, of course, we all know, as historians especially know, that what pandemics do is that they reveal underlying social forces that are often not visible um, during normal times. And I'm not actually sure that the pandemic has done that for South Africa and to the extent that uh, the marginalization that you speak of, Bolangiri, I 
I wonder to what extent uh, the pandemic has revealed what is blatantly obvious before. Um, so I think the challenge for us is to see what, what, what exactly do we, do we now know that we didn't know, you know, 15 months ago. Um, but thank you very much to all our panelists for an incredibly interesting um, uh, set of papers. Uh, and I will draw the session to a close now and please ask you to join us. I think I'm, I'm going to have to ask us to postpone the start of our next panel just by a few minutes. We're due to start at quarter past, so I, I'm going to propose that we start at 20 past just so that we, some of us can uh, stretch our legs and have a glass of water. Um, and, and we'll be with you very soon. Thank you very much.